heaven, great confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. So he wants you to be well prepared, to be forearmed, forewarned is to be forearmed, amen? So let's pray and get into the word this morning. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that he takes the things of God and makes them known to us, the deep things of God. We thank you again that you put a treasure inside of us in an earthen vessel, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of ourselves, who has made us able ministers of the good news of Jesus Christ. We believe the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, that it divides the soul and the spirit, the thoughts and marrow, and the very thoughts and intents of the heart, joints and marrow. We thank you, Father, believe this morning that the word will go deep down into the soil of each heart, that it will not be rooted out, it will not be choked out, it will not be uh, stolen by the devil, but it will go deep into the soil and bear forth fruit unto everlasting life. And we declare it, we believe it, and we declare the yoke is being destroyed because of the anointing in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 5 is our launch pad scripture we've been looking at. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. God's word translation says, keep your mind clear and be alert. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling about like a roaring lion as he looks for someone to devour. So how many realize you have an adversary, an enemy, that's looking to devour your life? Metaphorically, just like a lion would eat you, the devil wants to eat you spiritually. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to steal your health. He wants to wreck your body. He wants to wreck your marriage. He wants to wreck your kids. He wants to wreck your mind. He wants to wreck our country. He wants to wreck everything because he's a wrecker. He's a destroyer. Glory to God. But how many realize that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil? Amen. Amen. He came to R-A-Z-E, hell. Destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is a hell raiser. Glory to Jesus. Amen. With the word R-A-Z-E, you understand. To destroy, that's what that word means. Hallelujah. But you have an enemy. He's called the devil, known by different names. Last week we were looking at the five fatal and foolish I wills of Lucifer. And let's look over in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14 because we're going to pick up here where we kind of left off last week and hook up and go on. And I don't want to spend too much time in review this morning. Again, if you want to uh, urge you, you know, make sure you go on our website or go on our YouTube page or go on our Facebook page. The messages are on there each week. That's what we're recording them for. And share them with your friends. Send them to people. Put them on there. Share them, you know. Uh, we want the Word of God to go out. So you can go to our, our website. They're there every week. You can go to our Facebook page or under YouTube, it's just Timothy Jerry Sermons. So look up my name, Timothy Jerry Sermons, and you'll find our page, and you can find that week's message. But Isaiah chapter 14, verse 3, and I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation, and it says, In that wonderful day, when the Lord gives his people rest from sorrow and fear, from slavery and chains, you will taunt the king of Babylon. Now remember, when this is being spoken, Isaiah is foreta- foretelling uh, how you know, the nation of Israel which was carried into Babylon and afflicted by Babylon, will one day mock Babylon. And we know that God supernaturally delivered the children of Israel and brought them back into their homeland. Amen? Yes, your insolence is ended, speaking of Babylon. For the Lord has crushed your wicked power and broken your evil rule. You struck the people with endless blows of rage and held the nations in your angry grip with unrelenting tyranny. But finally the earth is at rest and quiet. Now it can sing again. Even the trees of the forest, the cypress trees and the cedar trees of Lebanon sing out this joyous song. Since you have been cut down, no one will come now to cut us down. In the, in the place of the dead, there is excitement over your arrival. The spirits of the world leaders and the mighty kings along long dead stand to see you. With one voice, they all will cry out, Now you are as weak as we are. Your might and your power were buried with you. The sound of the harp in your palace has ceased. Now maggots are your sheet and worms are your blanket. Now again, just for the sake of understanding, in Old Covenant scriptures, especially the prophetic scriptures, and Isaiah is one of the most messianic prophetic scriptures, Uh, books in the whole Bible there's oftentimes layers of understanding or layers of meaning you will oftentimes have the immediate proclamation against a nation or against a people or against a situation you'll have that which has a historic meaning at that moment but oftentimes along with that there's also another layer of prophetic meaning that is beyond 
the initial. And that's what we're seeing here in Isaiah because Isaiah is not just speaking about a nation called Babylon. I believe he's also speaking about Lucifer, about Satan, about this being that fell from heaven. And again, just for the sake of review, God did not create Satan. He did not create the devil. He created an angelic being named Lucifer who rebelled against God, was thrown out of heaven, banished from the throne room of God, and led a rebellion against God where one-third of the angelic hosts were called and pulled out of heaven by him, and he became a fallen angel, a fallen being, a rebel. He was the one which, uh, with which original sin came into being. He's the one that brought Adam and Eve into temptation and sin and darkness. He's the one that plunged the whole human race into sin. And he is the one that destroys nations. <clears throat> one of the things we're going to get into, and hopefully next week, we're laying a foundation in these first three weeks. And next week, we're going to start getting into spiritual warfare because that's what this series is about. It's about this warfare that we're engaged in. And again, whether you like it or not, whether you admit it or not, whether you believe it or not, you're in spiritual warfare just by nature of being on this planet. Again, there are two diametrically opposed kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. These kingdoms are as opposite as east is from the west. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of love, a kingdom of light, a kingdom of blessings, a kingdom of goodness. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The kingdom of the devil is destruction, it is darkness, it is oppression, it is painful, it is sickness, it is disease, it is every foul and vile thing that you could imagine. It came from one person, one being, and that is Lucifer, that is Satan who fell from heaven, was cast out of heaven. He is our advocate. And since the fall of man and since the beginning of nations, clear back in the book of Genesis, there is a demonic horde or demonic beings who rule the atmosphere around us. And these demonic beings can get into nations, they can get into cities, they can get into areas, they can get into people, and they can get into animals, and their objective is to manifest the kingdom of darkness in the world. Their objective is to manifest the devil's will in the planet. That's their objective. And that's why the Bible says the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Because he can't devour those who know their authority in Jesus Christ. He can't devour just anyone because we have a greater one that lives in us. And his name's Jesus Christ. God is far, far, far superior than the devil. And when Jesus arose from the dead, he stripped the devil of his authority that Adam had delegated to him or relegated to him when he fell. He stripped his dominion. One day, the enemy will be put under feet. But that day is not quite yet. Amen. Now, he has been put under our authority. We do have authority over the kingdom of darkness and demonic forces. But I just want you to realize that what Isaiah is speaking about here is he's referring to Babylon, because Babylon is the satanic epicenter of the devil's kingdom. You know, I used to listen to classic rock music years ago. I mean, I was a classic rock guy, and I remember there was always these songs that would come out about Babylon and rock music. The guys would sing and write songs about Babylon. And of course, you know, they weren't singing it like Sunday school kids. It always had some deep, mysterious... Why? Because Babylon throughout the world has always been understood as a place of sorcery, a place of demonic hordes, a place of darkness, a place of mystery. The Bible calls mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. This prostitute, it's descriptive of, that rides upon many upon a beast. Well, the beast represents nations of the end time that this demonic force, this demonic system of religion will ride upon. And Babylon is the very first uh, place where the devil began to bring forth demonic kingdoms in the earth. For instance, if you do a study on that's quite interesting, before the fall of man, there were no kingdoms. There was the earth. After the fall, we see the introduction of not just the planet, but we see what's called the world. John, the apostle, who wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote the book of Revelation. 
John talked extensively in his writings about the world. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the word he uses for world is the word cosmos, which means the order, the system. How many realize the kingdoms of this world, the governments and institutions of this world, even though the Bible says God sets kings up and brings them down, God ultimately will have the final authority, the final say in the world. But we realize if you look around the world we live in, there are numerous, 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 numerous countries and governments in, and leaders in those governments that are diametrically enemies of God. They're enemies of God's people. The judicial systems, the laws that are passed, and throughout the history of the world, what did the devil always use to oppress God's people? He used corrupt judges, and he used corrupt laws. Look at Daniel, carried away into Babylon, later becomes the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel, well, even before Daniel, what happens with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children, three Hebrews? Well, Nebuchadnezzar puts up a statue and says that everybody has to bow down and worship this statue, and whoever doesn't bow down and worship it will be thrown into a furnace and burned alive. And, of course, they're Jews. They can't bow down and worship a false god, and they say, we're not going to do it. And, of course, they're brought before the king, and he says, you're going to bow or you're going to burn. And, of course, the story is they refuse to bow, and by the supernatural power of God, they're thrown into the fire of furnace, but by the supernatural power of God, he delivers them without even the smell of of smoke upon them, and the cords that they tied them with are burnt off, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar looks and sees one like the Son of God walking in the fiery furnace. So what an awesome story of the delivering power of God. But before that, why were they thrown into the furnace to begin with? Because of demonic influence on kings that passes past godly, ungodly laws. Later on, Daniel with the Medo-Persian Empire, the sorcerers, the other ungodly leaders, they were jealous of Daniel, so they convinced the king to pass this law that anyone who prays to any other god, any other one of the king, for a certain amount of times will be thrown into the den of lions. Well, of course, Daniel just continues to do what he's always been doing. And what happens? They snare Daniel, and they have him thrown in the den of lions. And the story is, of course, that what happens? God supernaturally sends his angels, shuts the mouth of the lions, and Daniel is delivered. But what do we see throughout history? Look at, uh, we just had uh, the, the Jewish Feast of Purim, which is a celebration of the deliverance of the nation of Israel from um, destruction, total annihilation uh, in, in uh, Persia, right? And uh, what happens? Queen Esther, she comes before the king, type of Jesus, makes intercession for the nation of Israel and dis delivers them. Uh, from complete obliteration because they were going to be exterminated. God supernaturally delivers them. But what's the deal? You see throughout history, what does the enemy use to destroy and persecute and afflict God's people? He uses corrupt judges, he uses corrupt kings, and he uses corrupt, judicial, corrupt laws. What do we continue to see today? What are we seeing in our nation? What is it that's continually harassing people of God? Corrupt judges, corrupt laws, and corrupt people. Why are they corrupt? Because we have a devil, an adversary, demonic forces that are influencing regions, influencing laws, influencing people. And when you get the demonic influence, guess what you're going to have? You're going to have demonic laws. You're going to have things that are against God's people. The Bible speaks of the spirit of Antichrist. John the Apostle, who was the one whom Jesus loved, himself said that there are many Antichrists and that the spirit of Antichrist has gone out into the world. Now, when we speak like that, sometimes people, they go, oh my gosh, you guys are crazy, the Antichrist. I mean, you know... Uh, but anything that's against Christ is of the spirit of Antichrist. Anything that opposes the kingdom of Christ, opposes his will, opposes his gospel, is of the spirit of Antichrist. And there have been many types of the Antichrist throughout history. You know, the most, the most prolific, the most uh, distinct Antichrist we find in Scripture is uh, Antichus, who was a ruler during, after, uh, after, during the intertestamental time of the Seleucid Empire, who was one of the empires, the four empires that came out of, out of um, Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. And he came, comes into Jerusalem, slaughters a hog uh, on the, in the temple, desecrates the temple, 
and commands everybody to stop being followers of Messiah, followers of Yeshua, or God, excuse me, uh, to stop following the Old Testament scriptures, or you die. And uh, the Maccabeans led a revolt later on against him and overthrew him and drove him out of, out of Jerusalem and reinstituted the worship of the temple in the temple. And from there we get the, the Feast of Hanukkah, which means the Festival of Lights. But this Antichus is a type of the Antichrist who sets up an abomination in the temple. And Daniel sees him, spiritually speaking, and foretells of an end-time leader that will be like this man that will desecrate the temple of God and set himself up as king and God in the temple of God. So anything that's of an opposing thing to, to Jesus and his kingdom or God's word is of Antichrist. And so we see many types of Antichrist throughout history. Adolf Hitler was a type of the Antichrist. Somebody said that there's, has been a, there has been a type of the Antichrist in every generation. And what does the Antichrist do? Well, he's Antichrist. He's against Christ. That's what it means. To be Antichrist, he's against Christ. He's against everything there is to know about Christ. He's against Christ's people. Where does that come from? It comes from the devil. It comes from the kingdom of darkness. One day, ultimately, there will arise a ruler, a leader in the world who will be the ultimate fulfillment of the Antichrist, and he will be so completely demonically, satanically uh, possessed, and he will carry forth the devil's will in the earth to the utmost. And we're living right next to those days. Amen. Well, our message isn't about the Antichrist. Our message is about the devil. But I simply wanted to tie this in to make you realize that Babylon, the nation and the city of Babylon, has been the epicenter of demonic forces in the earth since the fall of man. Now this began, of course, with the Tower of Babel, right? And I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but sometimes people think that the Tower of Babel was this huge tower that they built like a skyscraper, and it was because it was so tall they were trying to reach the heavens. But that isn't what it was about at all. The Tower of Babel was a ziggurat, in a ziggurat, you can find ziggurats in, in Mexico. You can find ziggurats down in South America. The Incas, the Mayans had ziggurats. And a ziggurat is a stared, looks like a pyramid, but it has stairs going up, and you've seen them in history. I don't have a picture of one in my notes this morning. But a ziggurat basically is a place where they would worship and try to foretell the future and try to fort- worship their gods. And in the Tower of Babel, what they were really trying to do is build a monument an epicenter to man and to the kingdom of darkness. And they were trying to unite the, king, the human race against God. And God confounded their languages so that they couldn't. And it was from that time that the people were spread throughout the world. Well, last week we looked at, again, I, uh, in Isaiah chapter 14. If you turn there, please, with me. We'll pick up here and we're going to look at this again today. We looked at the five foolish and fatal I wills of Satan or Lucifer when he was in heaven. And in verse... 12 of chapter 14, God's speaking to Lucifer, and the word Lucifer really means, in the Latin Vulgate, it really came from the Latin Vulgate for the word Venus, the planet Venus. Uh, But it is apropos and applicable, and most Bible, conservative Bible scholars that I've ever read anything after agree in in consensus that when, when Isaiah is speaking of Lucifer here, he's speaking about this fallen being. Amen. And it says here, and I'm, this is the living, New Living Translation, so if it doesn't use the word, it used the word shining star or day star, which is also a name given to Christ in the New Testament. But again, what is Lucifer? What was his objective? To become like God, to be God, to take the throne of God. So verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said in yourself, and again, here, who is he ultimately, who is he speaking to at the moment? Babylon. Who's the spiritual application to? The devil. Lucifer, who was in heaven. And this is what he said. For you said in your, to yourself, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God or the angels of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the highest heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. 
Do you notice something about these declarations? They're full of I. Because that's what Satan's heart is full of himself. He was, he was perfect, the Bible says, until the day that iniquity was found in him. And what the enemy was really guilty of, his initial original sin, was coveting or wanting something he had no right to have. Pride and covetousness. He wanted a position that was only God's and God's alone. You notice how when he tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, what's he say to Eve? You will be like God. Well, she already was like God. But what does he plant in Eve's heart? What does he plant in Adam's heart? What does he plant in every human being's heart? This idea, this idea that you should have something that is forbidden. Something that God says you should not have. The enemy wants you to believe that I should have it. Do you notice what came into the human race when sin came into the human race? Every child born into this planet, you don't have to train them, you don't have to coax them, you don't have to encourage them to resist the word no. If you know anything about toddlers, toddlers will by nature, if you say no, they'll just make a beeline to do what you don't want them to do. Where did it come from? It came with the fall. Their very nature, the very darkness of, of sin, and I'm not saying a toddler is a sinful being because babe, children, they don't know the difference between right and wrong. But it is built within the human DNA of darkness that came into our being when the sin came into our being and the fall came to just want to disobey, to rebel. Our culture today thinks that liberty is the freedom to indulge sin. Our culture thinks today that freedom is the liberty to do whatever I want to do. But that's not freedom, that's bondage. Because if you are allowed to do anything you want to do, you're going to destroy yourself. And that's what we have going on today in our country where we have people all over the place that think, well, I should be able to do anything I want to do and no one should be able to say it's wrong. And if you try to tell me it's wrong, you're hateful and you're a bigot and you're judging me and oh, how dare you say it's wrong. Well, God says certain things are wrong. And, you, you know, you can go ahead and do it, but you're going to pay the price. It's going to cost you. And it's costing our world. It's, it's the wages of sin is death. Again, I said, it's not that God's a killjoy. It's not that God is a meanie. But God loves you, and God knows more than we know. And God realizes that things that we think are good sometimes are not good. Just like you as a loving parent, you won't know more than your kids, Hopefully. You know, we live in a society today, again, where it's like, you know, we're hearing that parents don't know more than their kids. You know, just let your kid raise themselves. No, no, it's our responsibility to put boundaries on our kids. If you love your children, you'll put boundaries around them instead of let them run wild. Amen. Well, the Bible says here, so he says, I will be like the most light. Look at verse 15. Instead, this is the consequence. You will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Everyone there will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? Is this the one who destroyed the world and made it into a wasteland? Is this the king who demolished the world's greatest cities and had no mercy on his prisoners? Sounds like the enemy. Because this is exactly what his kingdom is doing. It is decimating the world. I mean, if you want to look and see what the kingdom of darkness looks like, just look at what's going on in the nation of Syria today. Look around the Middle East today where ISIS and these demonic hordes are running rampant. You'll see what the kingdom of darkness, this is what the devil wants to do. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He is in the business of hurting people, wounding people, maiming people, bringing people into bondage, and ultimately killing you and sending your soul to hell. That's what he wants. He despises you. He hates you with everything that's in him. Because his very nature is hatred and lies and deception. And the only way he can attack God and hurt God at all is by hurting God's creation. Because God loves people. The devil can't hurt God. What can he do against God? He's a gnat compared to God. But he can hurt God's creation. Just like the enemy can hurt your children. And it grieves you. Amen? That's how the devil tries to hurt people. He, if he can't hurt you, he'll hurt the people you love. 
If he can't get you, he'll attack your family. He'll attack your children. He'll attack your wife. He'll attack your husband. He'll attack your friends. He'll attack the things you love. That's what the devil's all about. He's about attacking, attacking and destroying the very things that your heart is fixed upon. That's why Jesus said, make sure that your treasures are in heaven, not on this earth. Because everything on this earth is open, can be attacked by the devil. And he does. Amen. So the world's going to look at this being and say, are you the one that destroyed the nations and brought them to ruin? They're going to be kind of surprised when they finally do see him. Verse 18, the kings of the north nations lie in stately glory, each in his own tomb. But you will be thrown out of your grave like a worthless branch, like a corpse tum trampled underfoot. You will be dumped into a mass grave with those killed in battle. You will descend to the pit. You will not be given a proper burial, for you have destroyed your nation and slaughtered your people. The descendants of such an evil person will never again receive honor. Now, God, dualistically, I believe, is speaking not only of the nation of Babylon, but he's also speaking of, of Satan. And God, parallelism, the parallelism here that is used throughout Hebrew scriptures is that just as you are going to see the desolation and desecration and demise of the nation and city of Babylon, you're going to see the desolation and desecration of Satan himself. God prophetically, and we're going to look at this in a moment, God prophetically said that the nation of Babylon would never be rebuilt. The city of Babylon would never be rebuilt. And you know that it never has been, and it never will be. Amen. It says, kill the man's children, verse 21. Let them die because of their father's sins. They must not rise and conquer the earth, filling the world with their cities. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies say. I myself have risen against Babylon. I will destroy its children and its children's children, says the Lord. I will make Babylon a desolate place of owls filled with swamps and marshes. I will sweep the land with a broom of destruction. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. Why is God so adamantly opposed to Babylon? Because Babylon represents the epicenter, again, of Satan and his will in the earth. The Bible says that Babylon is a haven of demons, a haven of witchcraft, a haven of darkness. And so God is prophetically using Babylon as a type of what he is going to ultimately one day do to the devil's kingdom and the kingdoms that align themselves with him. Now again, going back to Nimrod, or going back to the Tower of Battle, Babel, this is where Babel came from. This is where Babylon eventually came from. And this is from Nimrod. Nimrod was a wicked, wicked man who led a rebellion against God, who wanted to establish an anti-God system of worship. And it was Nimrod who led to the building of the Tower of Babel. Now actually... Out of Nimrod and out of this demonic, satanic system of worship that he set up, he literally established a religion that you will see shards of throughout all, pretty much every world religion today. And this was Babylonian sun god worship. We even see shards of Babylonian sun god worship that have been filtered down when the Roman Empire merged with Christianity under Constantine. Things that we don't even realize that aren't, didn't come out of Christianity, they came out of paganism. And I'm not saying that people that worship this way are pagans. They just don't even know that they're there. There's things you can look at through history, and I don't want to get too bogged down in this. For instance, if you look at the adoration of the mother and child, that did not come out of Christianity. It came out of Babylonian sun god worship. Because later, Nimrod's mother, Samarelius, known by, she had a son named Tamaz, and Tamaz was, the legend has it, that was gored to death by a wild boar. And Tamaz, uh, Samarelius said that she became impregnated by the reincarnated spirit of Tamaz, and that her child was, was the reincarnation, and she called herself the queen of heaven. And Bible tells us that um, during Ezekiel's times that he looked and he saw outside the temple, he saw women weeping for the queen of heaven. Israel had fallen prey to Babylonian sun god worship. Baal worship, the same thing. And all of these things came into 
uh, the world because of this man Nimrod. It was passed down, it was augmented and grew, and our message isn't so much about that, so I don't want to get bogged down in that this morning. But the Jewish historian Josephus says, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah. He was a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it was through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, See no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his powers. Man, doesn't that sound like what you see through governments throughout the ages? Tyranny. Making people wards of the state so they can control you. To turn people away from God. To turn people away from the worship of God. Amen? That was, that was Nimrod's pursuit. And Babel and Babylon came out of this. It was a demonic worship center that all world religions sprung from. Just like all humanity had an original place we all came from, Mesopotamia, all world religion had a common place that it came from. And you will find traces of Babylonian sun god worship in almost every world, really pretty much in every world religion throughout the, the world. You will find traces of it because it has infiltrated the whole world and spread throughout the whole world. Amen. So at the heart of world religion, at the heart of all things contrary to Christ, is man-centered worship. Humanism. The worship of man. The worship of something other than God. The worship and recognition of something other than the God of heaven as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because this is what Satan's ultimate goal is. Is to turn people's minds and hearts away from the true and living God and occupy their minds and hearts and lives with something that isn't God. You know, the devil doesn't care if you worship. He just doesn't want you worshiping God. I mean, more people are going to hell on the planet today because of world religion than any other thing. I mean, people, modern atheists in America today and in the West, they think that they're going to stomp out religion. The world is more religious than it's ever been. Religion is the world. It is the world. I mean, India has, what, 20-some thousand, I think it is, or 100,000, I don't know. Somebody told me this the other day. How many thousands of gods there are in India, in the Hindu language? Somebody know the number? I can't think of it right off the top of my head. But it's a lot. Thousands. I was talking to a brother of mine because they're, they're planning on building some kind of Eastern mystic religious center down the road from here. A meditation center. And it's, a, it's amazing how Westerners and Americans swallow this Eastern mystic hogwash. And it is hogwash. You know, like we should embrace, because you'll hear people say stuff like this, well, we need to embrace the ancient wisdom. Okay, let me just follow that through to its logical conclusion. India, thousands of God. If any nation on earth has ever embraced mysticism, has ever embraced meditation, has ever, and meditation in and of itself is not bad, transcendental meditation I think is bad. We're to meditate upon the word of God. Okay, we're not to empty ourselves and welcome demonic spirits into us. That's what, you know. So meditation's not bad. But let's, let's just line the two up side by side. Okay, we've got India, which would be the, the prototype, wouldn't it, of world religion. Thousands upon thousands of gods, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. Just exactly how has that worked out for India? One of the most destitute nations on earth throughout its history. And they go, well, it was because of colonialism. No, it's still been destitute. Starvation, poverty, the rats, because of their religion, eat tons and tons of grain. If it were not for capitalism in India, India would be a backward third world nation. It is only because of Western influence in India that India has become a middle class and middle class and people are prospering. I know that's not very politically correct, is it? but it is the truth. My point is simply this. Let's look at the nations that have embraced Christianity and look at their economic condition, look at their human rights condition, 
look at their social condition, and let's look at the nations that have embraced Eastern mysticism. I'll take Christianity any day. Don't talk about, you know, this, this, oh, we need to embrace this ancient mysteries. That has done nothing for humanity but lead them into bondage, where people will have their babies bitten by snakes and killed. They'll sacrifice their babies to the crocodile gods. It is Christianity that brings liberty. It is Christianity that brings human dignity. It is Christianity that brings prosperity to nations. Period. Those nations, the most blessed and prosperous nations in this planet, and the most well sought after nations with human rights are nations that have embraced Christianity. The proof of the pudding's in the eating. So, you know, thank God for Christianity coming to India. Glory to God. So I'll take Christianity over Eastern mysticism any day. Because I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he'll keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Amen. Well, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 13 here. We're going to... Well, we want to swing... Yeah, did we finish 14? I think we did, didn't we? Let's go back. Let's, let's swing down here because we've been, uh, we've been looking at... Babylon, the overthrow of it. I want to jump to the end of this message because I want to wrap it up with this. And that is Satan's Lucifer's or Satan's ultimate end because he's not Satan anymore. Ultimately, we're going to see what happens to him. Look over in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, because this is where what's going to happen to Satan and his kingdom and all those who are associated with him. And it says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, And I saw another angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him. For the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. Then another angel followed him through the sky, shouting, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. Because she has made all the nations of the world drink the wine of, the pa- of her passionate immorality. I love how it says this in the Living Bible, New Living Translation. She has made all the nations of the world drink of her passionate immorality. Now throughout scripture, harlots, prostitutes are predominantly used as types of satanic religion. Because, why? Because the very nature of prostitution is something that's illicit. It's something outside of the boundaries of God, and everybody understands that. I mean, not everybody, but the point is, as a believer, we understand that of sexual immorality, that would be the furthest thing outside of the boundaries of God's prescribed way. Amen? And so we get a clear picture of when the Bible uses a prostitute as something representing religion. We get a picture of this is something that is, is, has no fidelity. The Bible says a prostitute, she, or a seductress, she, she commits her seductress, and, and then she wipes her mouth and says, what have, what have I done wrong? The point of it is, is the Bible uses this as illustrative language, so we get a clear word picture here. And what's the word picture we're getting? that this end-time, demonic, satanic kingdom will be ripe, full of religion. I believe, personally, that what we're seeing happening in the Middle East today with radical Islam is a precursor to the Antichrist kingdom of darkness. Do you realize that the followers of ISIS believe they're doing the will of God, Allah? Allah Akbar, as they cut people's heads off, as they rape women and children and crucify little children in the name of their God. There is no mercy with these people. And people say, well, that's not really Islam. Islam's a religion of peace. Then you need to go see Osama Dakta, who's coming to, uh, live, uh, to Radisson Evangelical Free Church next Friday, the 13th. Osama Dakta, who's on uh, VCY America, who is Egyptian-born, speaks about Islam and he truly points the picture what really Islam is and it's not a peaceful religion at all. The Quran is not peaceful. Oh, yes it is. People that say that don't know the Quran. 
They're just, they're just mimicking what people say about Islam. Well, I know Muslims. Not all Muslims are hateful. Of course they're not. Because most Muslims in America aren't practicing Islam. They're like people that profess to be Christians who aren't practicing Christianity. But true fundamentalist Muslims who you're seeing it, ISIS is the closest thing historically you could liken to Muhammad. Because Muhammad, that's where they learned it from. Muhammad. Because Muhammad was a pedophile warlord who cut people's heads off and raped women and killed people that didn't convert to Islam. That's what he did. You know, our, our role model, our one that we want to follow after is Jesus Christ. Now, if you put the two side by side again, do a comparison, <laughs> uh, which one would be the better role model? Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Muhammad, by his own admission, said he was a sinner. Amen? Well, we don't want to get into that too much, but I urge you next Friday night, Osama Dakta is going to be at the Evangelical Free Church in Radisson, 6.30. Make plans to go see it Friday the 13th. What a good night to go hear about Islam. Amen? So praise the Lord. <laughs> Talk about a slasher movie. Amen? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but he says, I saw this angel flying through, and he says, fallen, fallen. What is, what is he calling out? Because she has made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality, her ungodliness. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, anyone who worships the beast in his stature or who accepts the mark of the, in his forehead or in his hand must drink the wine of the, God's anger. It, was, it has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Now, we're not going to get into the mark of the beast, but basically what they're saying is anyone who has followed after the devil and his kingdom are going to receive the devil and his kingdom's reward, which is death, destruction, and eternal torment in the lake of fire. In other words, you don't want to have anything to do with the devil. Amen. Revelation 19.20 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Speaking of Jesus Christ. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on his horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. This is speaking of a great end time battle at the end of the great tribulation. This is the battle of Armageddon. Where the armies of the world will literally, once again, as deluded as the devil is, think that they're really going to overthrow Jesus Christ. And Jesus is going to descend from heaven in the clouds with great glory, riding on a white horse. He's going to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth, and he's going to destroy the Antichrist armies. He's going to kill them with the brightness of his coming. He's going to capture the Antichrist and the false prophet alive, and he's going to have a tribunal, and he's going to cast them into hell, into destruction. And they're going to be destroyed. And then an angel is going to take hold of the devil. And he's going to bind him and throw him into the abyss, what's called typically the bottomless pit. And he's going to bind him, and he will no longer have access to this planet for 1,000 years. And it's during that time that Jesus Christ will come and set up his millennial 1,000-year reign. And there will be no demonic influence on this planet at that time. None. Whatsoever. All nations will know that Jesus is Lord. He will beat their, they will beat their, their swords into plowshares and they'll practice war no more. And for 1,000 years on this planet, we will have absolute peace. We will have absolute godly reign. God will reign on the planet over the nations. And all nations will know God. All nations will know about God. All nations will know. And won't the Arab nations be in shock in that day because they hate the Jews so much that a Jew is going to rule the world. But at the end of that thousand years, 
Even though God has been on the planet for 1,000 years, everybody on this planet that's born, everybody that's alive, will know who God is. There won't be a question, who is God? But after 1,000 years of God's rule, absolute heaven come to earth, absolute the best life you could ever imagine on this planet, Lucifer, Satan, will be loosed from the bottomless pit, and it says he will go forth and deceive the nations. Now, how in the world could that happen? And why would it happen? And why would God do that? Because God wants to make sure that if you're for him, you're for him, and if you're going to follow him, it's out of your own free will. There will not be any person stand before the great judgment seat of God in that day that will have any excuse and say, well, God, you didn't give me a fair shake. God, I didn't have an opportunity. God, you know, if I'd have known that, I would have surrendered my life to you. God, you know, you're just not fair. No one on that day will be able to say that. Every mouth will be stopped, and every human being that is before that judgment seat will be found guilty. Because God, right now, is going to give the human race all the sin and darkness they want. That's what's happening right now on this planet, folks. Human beings are being allowed to have all the demonic force they want. And the devil himself, in all of his ungodly immorality, is going to come to the planet and live and rule the planet. Most of the nations, and the world is going to be able to suck up and live in the cesspool they want. To the point that it's almost going to destroy the whole planet. Jesus will return, take all of that out of the planet, and rule the world as God Almighty, showing what God's kingdom on earth will really be like. So what God is allowing to happen, God is going to give man everything they want, they'll still hate him. And then God is going to take the devil out of the world, and he's going to show them what his kingdom is like in contrast, which is wonderful, and there's still going to be people that hate him. There are still going to be people that reject God. And it tells us in Revelation 20, verse 7, Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from the prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, which means end-time nations, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Now this morning we want to give you an opportunity. You are here. You've heard this message today. Maybe you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you think this is all, you know, malarkey. Maybe say, well, I don't believe any of that. But you are without excuse now because you've heard the truth. And you will give an account for your life one day. God loves you. God did everything in his power to make sure that you will spend eternity with him in heaven. God did everything by sending his son to make sure that you have eternal life. He loves you with an everlasting love. He only wants the best and good for you your life. He wants to do you good all your days and not evil. But there's one thing you have to do. You have to surrender to him. You have to surrender your life to him. You have to give up your will and say, Lord, come and be Lord of my life. That's the hardest thing for people to do. It's the hardest thing for human beings to admit they're wrong. And it's the hardest thing for people, human beings, to surrender to the will of God. But that's exactly what God demands of you. If you save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life and you give up your will today for God's kingdom, you will find what really life is all about. There's no greater offer that God offers you this morning. I'd like you to bow your heads this morning. I just want to pray with you today as we're closing. If you're here this morning and you're not fully convinced in your heart 100%, if if your life depends on it, Would you be fully convinced, absolutely, you'd stake your life on it, that if you were to die today, heaven would be your home? That you would spend eternity with God? Or are you not sure? Or would the lake of fire be your home? If you were to die right now, in your present condition, where would you spend eternity? That's the real question. And what will you do with Jesus Christ? If you're not absolutely convinced that you would spend eternity with God, if you couldn't fully, wholeheartedly say, if you stood before him today, yes, Lord, you are my Lord, and I surrendered my life to you, and I'm living for you with all my heart. If you can't fully say that, then this morning I want to give you an opportunity to first and foremost receive him and surrender to him. If you're a Christian, you've received Christ, but you're not really where you need to be, and there's some things in your life you want to get cleaned up today and get back on the right track. Maybe you've wandered off, you've fallen away from God, you're you're not really where you need to be, and you want to get back today, I want to give you an opportunity. 
So this morning, if that's you, if you say, Pastor Tim, I want to get things right this morning. I want to get right with God. You know, this kind of shakes me up a little bit. And I need to get things right. If that's you, I want you to, on the count of three, raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. If you, number one, you want to get your life right with Christ. You've never been saved. Never, you're not sure if heaven would be your home. You're not sure if you'd be saved. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. Or number two, you're a Christian. You have received Christ, but you've fallen away from him. You're not where you need to be, and you want to get that right. So on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand if either of those are your situation. You want to get right with God, or you're a Christian, you're backslidden. So I'm going to count to three, and on three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Praise the Lord. Well, the Lord loves you. And the Lord is so excited that you are ready to respond. Now, I'd just like everybody to stand up where you are at this morning. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. And we're going to pray this prayer of repentance, that we turn from our sin. And uh, we're going to pray this prayer all together with you. Praise the Lord. And I'm not doing that just to make things easier for you, but... We're just going to pray it together because we're all in for, we're for you, not against you. Amen? Amen. So let's say this together. Lord God, I have sinned against you. I have broken your commandments. And I deserve your judgment. But I ask for mercy. Something I don't deserve. But Jesus made available for me. I believe Jesus died for my sins. That he was raised from the dead. And he's seated at the right hand of God. I believe he's coming back. So right now, according to what I believe, I renounce my sin. I turn from darkness. I renounce the devil and his kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. And I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Jesus, be my Lord take control of my life, my mind, my will, my emotions, and my actions. From this day forward, I will serve you. Give me strength. Give me help. You are my Lord, and I am your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Now, it's very important if you prayed that prayer this morning, if you've not, if never been a Christian, it's important that you tell people what you do with your life. It's important that you tell people that Jesus is my Lord. Seal the deal, amen? Tell them. Tell somebody today before you leave this building, if you prayed that prayer, hey, you know what? I prayed that prayer and God, God's good. God's in my life, amen? People will be excited about it. They won't, don't, it's not embarrassing. We, we need to be bold about Jesus Christ, amen? We all prayed that prayer, you know? Amen. Amen. I prayed that prayer numerous times in my life. Praise God. So we all need it. Amen? Amen? Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord bless you in coming in and going out. May you possess the gates of your enemy. Those who come against you one way, may they flee from you seven ways. May you prosper in all that your hand is put to. And may you abound with every good and perfect gift from the King of kings and Lord of lords. And may the Lord fulfill all the number of your days and those of your children to a thousand generations. Amen. Well, Father, thank you for the food we're about to receive and the fellowship. We ask that your hand and blessing be upon it. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. Please come next door to have some fellowship with us.